before about the balance of forces, the question of balance of forces between the Israeli and Arab side is still very relevant, and still very relevant as a moral issue in, in the propaganda war, in, in the sense that uh, today the Palestinians under Israeli occupation, not under Israeli occupation, are cast as the underdog with Israel as a persecutor, the overdog, and so on. And in, I think that also has to be put into perspective. In, and the perspective being that essentially we have a state of Israel which is disliked and um, by the Arab world in general, by Arab societies around it, uh, by the Palestinians as well, and which would like Israel essentially to disappear. And if they felt strong enough, they'd probably go to war and make it disappear. Uh, the Arab world around, despite one or two peace treaties Israel has with two of the Arab states. And I think that the Israeli-Palestinian relationship and, and the balance of forces in which the Palestinians obviously are very, very much weaker than the state of Israel which occupies some of them in, and in some way persecutes some of them. In, the Palestinians have to be seen as part of that greater Arab and Muslim nation which wants Israel to disappear. And that's how Israeli sees them. They don't see themselves, Israelis, as fighting against the Palestinians and occupying these poor Palestinians. They see themselves as occupying these poor Palestinians who are an extension, including Israel's Arabs as well, not just the Palestinians in the occupied territories, but Israel's Arab minority of 1.5 million are seen as part of that greater Arab world which wants to destroy Israel, essentially, in its heart. That's what it wants to do. In, in, so so, so the, the, I, the problem of balance of force has to be seen in both contexts, that is, within the wider Arab-Israeli context and within the narrow context of Israel versus these poor Palestinians who are in large measure under Israeli occupation. Uh, it has to be contextualized correctly. I'll just, it just came to me because a, a few months ago in Washington there was the, um, a man called Ayman Hood, uh, Ayman Hood, I think is his name, who is the head of the Israeli-Arab party, um, yeah, Ude, Ude, uh, who, who's, who in the Knesset, in Israel's parliament, and he came and talked in Brookings, and he said, well, tomorrow I'm going off to see Martin Luther King's fat family in Atlanta or wherever, and, and he contextualized Israel and its Arab minority and how it treats its Arab Israeli citizens as part of a, a civil rights and, a, you know, a human rights issue. And it is that. There is also a human rights and civil rights issue, but it's also Israel's attitude towards its, its Arab population is also a function of how that Arab population defines itself. And when it defines itself as part of the Palestinian people, not as Israeli citizens, and the Palestinians define themselves as part of the wider Arab nation, those relations between the Israeli state and its Arab minority also have to be seen within that wider context. Uh, not as human rights or just human rights and civil rights issues, but a problem of political forces um, you know, contending over a piece of land and, and so on, um, uh, and in the wider context. And yeah, they just, just to correct me, I should add that. So, and also the, the title of the paper in that thing says, bring it up to date, or think about 48 in terms of today as well. This also uh, applies to the current uh, situation. Thank you. Um, my question is, what was the position of the uh, main superpowers uh, at that time? Why didn't they intervene directly? Uh, uh, was there any indirect intervention, I mean, supplying weapons or, or something like that? Okay, that, that's, that's an interesting subject. Um, um, politically, America and Russia supported the partition, the um, proposal of the United Nations of November 47, meaning they supported the establishment of a Jewish state, both of them, the Russians and the Americans. It was one of the few issues uh, in the Cold War in, in which the two superpowers agreed for a brief moment in time, luckily for Zionism. Um, but the Americans followed that with an embargo, an embargo on um, uh, napkins are quite good. And they, they followed it on a, with an embargo on all arms supplies to the Middle East. Israelis, the Zionists, had hoped that the Americans, who supported them politically, would also send arms or supplied, sell arms, to the Jewish side, because the Arab side was being armed by the British and the French until May 48. So they hoped that the, this would counter the, America, the French and the 
a English arming of the Arabs, but the Americans in December 47 imposed an embargo on the all armed shipments to the Middle East, which meant an embargo on the Israeli side, because they weren't supplying the Arabs before that. Um, and this was taken very hard by the Israelis, but then the Russians stepped in. They, if you, if you remember in European history, in the February '48, they basically took over Hungary. They threw the foreign minister out of the window, um, um, and, and basically dictated Czech foreign policy from February '48. And the, the Czechs signed arms agreements with the Jewish agency, meaning the Haganah, uh, from the beginning of 48, and began to deliver weapons to the Jews from the end of March 1948, uh, more substantially after uh, the state was declared after the 14th of May. So the, the East Bloc, using Czechs, through Czechoslovakia, basically supplied Israel with its armaments, or most of its armaments, in the course of the Korean <coughs> War. And this was decisive, certainly in April, which was a decisive month, April 48, in overcoming the Arab militias in the Civil War part. Um, the Americans continued to support Israel politically, even though they, in, in March 48, um, they sort of seemed to step back from support from, for partition and proposed a trusteeship arrangement in which the Palestine would pass over to America to a United Nations supervision. There wouldn't be two states, but there would be a UN trusteeship for an indefinite period. Uh, but then the, the Americans stepped back from that as well. Kuhn said, I didn't mean it, uh, and I spoke without my authorization. In, and America basically cleaved to partition. After May 48, the Americans politically supported Israel, though tried to limit Israeli conquests. That is, it, it sort of hampered Israel politically from taking over parts of the Negev, or when it went into Sinai, it pushed the Israeli army back by ordering Israel basically to leave Egyptian territory and go back to the Negev, back to Israel. And the Russians were more politically supportive of Israel, apart from the armaments, were more, more supportive of Israel in the course of the war. Um, the more interesting side, or the most interesting international player here is the British, because the British, as I pointed out at the beginning, were in Palestine until May 48, um, basically trying to cleave a, to a neutral stance, um, and were basically politically antagonistic towards Zionism, which they had been from 38 on, 1938 on. A politically antagonistic, antagonistic towards Zionism. They did reluctantly recognize Israel in 49 and accept its UN membership. Uh, but until 1958, they were basically on the Arab side because Britain had enormous interests in the Arab world. They had treaties of alliance with Egypt, uh, with Egypt and with uh, um, Iraq. They had bases in Egypt and bases in Iraq and so on. Uh, so they were uh, essentially geopolitically aligned with the, 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 the Arabs uh, through the early and mid 50s. But uh, by 1958, after the Suez crisis and the failure of the Anglo-French uh, attack on, in, uh, in Egypt in 1956, uh, they basically shied away from the Arab world, the British. Uh, and by 58, they sort of made their peace with the Jewish state. Um, that, that's an, an outline. Hey, can I have a quick follow-up? Uh, when and what changed the policy of the Soviet Union? Uh, when they okay. started to support okay. the Arab yeah, the, the, the Soviets, nobody knows. The, again, here's a question of archives. The Soviet archives remain closed. They were open for a brief period, some of them, during Glasnost under, uh, what's his name, Gorbachev. Um, they opened the Foreign Ministry archives, but they didn't open the KGB, they didn't open the Politburo, they didn't open the Presidium of the Communist Party. So the essential uh, centers of power in the Soviet Union never opened their archives and remain closed to this day. So we don't really know what motivated Stalin in fashioning his Middle Eastern policy and Israeli Arab policy in 47-49. Um, the conjecture is that the Soviets were motivated by um, a desire to see Britain undermined in the Middle East and supporting the Israelis, the, Brit the Arabs were sort of aligned, the Arab states were aligned with Britain supporting the Israelis and if the Brit British Arabs allies lost in the war, supporting the Israelis would be beneficial to undermining the British presence in the Middle East as it turned out correctly. Um, the Soviets may have slightly, marginally been driven by sympathy for the Jews. This is a bit difficult to understand because Stalin was an anti-Semite, and that, that's not, not in doubt. But, but the people around him, and many of them were married to Jews or were Jews in some way, and he may have been influenced by advisors as well, um, uh, uh, who had some sympathy with the Jews because they were Jewish themselves or because they shared a common 
suffering with the Jews uh, during World War II. In other words, the Soviets were killed in large numbers, Jews were killed in large numbers by Germans. They may have had some uh, uh, sympathy for the Jews, which may have in some way influenced Stalin in this reaching this policy. What happened in 4950 was that Stalin, Stalin may also have been influenced by the fact that the Zionist movement, as I said before, was led by socialists. And he maybe thought that that would allow him, the Soviet Union, in the Cold War, a toehold in Palestine. Uh, because they're socialists, you know, fellow reds or pinks or whatever. But he was quickly disabused of that idea uh, when the Ben-Gurion and the others basically said, we're a democracy, we favor the West, 4950, we favor the West in the East-West struggle. There was a famous vote in the UN about um, Korea, sending troops to Korea, and that's when Israel voted with the Americans, and that was the end of the Israeli-Soviet alliance. Israel didn't send troops in the end. It was supposed to send one paratroop battalion to to Korea, it didn't send it, but it nonetheless voted and supported the UN uh, intervention in Korea against the uh, communists, and that basically ended it. But the Soviets continued to supply Israel through Czechoslovakia with arms until 1951. It's a bit strange, but they paid their debts. In other words, they were paid money, and they continued sending Spitfires, in fact, Czech Spitfires, to the Israeli army until somewhere in 51, um, even though the, the alliance had been broken. The, the Soviet Jews in Syria also played a part in all this. The Israelis may have hoped by keeping warm relations with the Soviets that the Soviets would open their doors to Soviet Jewish immigration. The Jews would be allowed out and support the Zionist venture by simply coming in large numbers to Palestine. But this never happened. The Soviets didn't allow Jews out. In Romania, they allowed some Jews out. But basically, they didn't allow Jews out of the Soviet Union. So this also helped sour relations in 4950. That's in short. Rami, uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, and I want to ask you about uh, what do you think about the future of the uh, peace process between Israeli and Palestinian under the new American administration? This is part one. Part two, do you think the solution of two states is still valid nowadays? If the answer is no, what is the alternative to the two state solutions? Thank you. Well, well, I, I know a bit about the past. I don't know too much about the future. What you're asking? Expectation. Expectation. I would say, I would say, say like this. Look, the, the, nobody knows what Trump's about, what he wants, what he doesn't want, what he believes in, what he doesn't believe in, what he knows. He doesn't seem to know very much about anything, so he has, nobody knows what his policy is on the Middle East, to be quite frank. So I don't expect anything from them, but it's not really a problem of Trump. It's a matter of Israel and the Arabs, Israel and the Palestinians. And I don't think that there's a solution in prospect between Israel and the Palestinians. I said why, partly because of the refugee problem, which is insoluble, but in general because I think the Palestinians still hope to get all of Palestine at the end of the day. This is what they want. That's my, my view of Palestinians. The Hamas says so, eh, frankly, and the Fatah says so occasionally when they speak in Arabic. They don't, they, when they speak in English, they talk about two states. But when they speak in Arabic, they talk about the Palestinian flag over Jerusalem, which means all of Palestine. I think that's what they mean. So I, I don't think that's a basis for a solution. In Israelis, which Israel can agree to, and in Israel also the right wing is, has become stronger in recent years, which makes Israelis more reluctant also, in the end of the day, to go to a two-state solution. So I don't think there is going to be a two-state solution. Um, alternatives to the two-state solution don't exist, because a one-state solution won't work. Um, Israeli uh, Jews lived under Arab rule for hundreds of years. We know how that ended. They didn't especially enjoy it before they were thrown out. And when they were thrown out, of course, they didn't appreciate it. So, so um, I, I don't think that they want to live under an, in an Arab majority state in Palestine. And that's what a one-state solution means. Because if it involves refugee return, you end up with more Arabs than Jews. And that's what the Arabs demand um, as part of the solution. So I, I don't think there's a one-state solution, and I don't think there's a two-state solution. There is no solution. It's going to continue as it is as it is today. That's the way I see it, but I'm pessimistic. And uh, let me add just one small thing to that. Um, the Middle East surprises people, so even though I, you know, I might even be surprised about that. But, um, but as it looks at the moment, there's no solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment and for, for example, for uh, the explanation of the identity of the Palestinians, of the civil war, and so forth. It reminds me, actually, I will be more controversial now, 
uh, of the situation in Central Europe. George Chopin wrote about ethnicity and nationalism that uh, the states in Central Europe were uh, built up of a national myth. And he said the myth about territory, about suffering, about, uh, I, I've written it down, about unjust treatment, about bravery, military bravery, revival, ethical origin. And when you talk about the Palestinians, it reminds me to what George Chopin said about, about the myth of uh, the, uh, the national good of some, some, some population. So my, my question is, uh, if this unclear situation, also the, the wars, uh, the Israel Arab wars, are leading to improve the Palestinian identity and memory more than ever, Look, there, there's a tradition in Israeli historiography which says that Palestinian, the emergence of Palestinian nationhood was closely linked to Zionism, in the sense that it was a reaction to the Zionists taking over Palestine. That's what brought about separate Palestinian nationalism. That's the way uh, many Israelis, and there's something in it. I'm, I'm not sure it's completely true, because the Arab world in general became independent. That is, Syrians wanted independence for Syria, Iraqis wanted, and they got eventually. So maybe that would have happened in Palestine without Zionism. But Zionism certainly was a catalyst. It helped speed things up. And also the emergence of Palestinian um, uh, nationalism. You're right that the, the nations nations are built also on myths. They're built on history, but the, the, the history is usually to distort it in some way in, in, into myths to help uh, c consolidate and solidify the, the, the national movements and national consciousness. And the Palestinians are at that stage in which, uh, uh, and they also have a foreign occupation on top of them, which which helps consolidate it. Uh, so. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a problem, there's a problem, let me diverge for a second, there's a, there's a problem here, um, uh, this is true probably about all na na national movements and so on, that they're not able to shed myths very easily and look truthfully at the past. And uh, a, re a recent example of that, I just re reviewed a book which came out, uh, I think it's an important book, um, by an Israeli Arab historian about what happened in 48 and the 50s, and, and he basically subordinates his history to the, these myths, the victimhood, and the Arabs did nothing wrong, and everybody else was to blame, the British, the Americans, the Zionists. And that's how it's written. And, and, and uh, it doesn't look like we're anywhere near what, what that book means. And this is a serious historian writing, but when it comes to that subject, he's unable to, unable to shed myths. They're there. Uh, that's, that's, dominates his mind. So what it means is we're probably still at a stage in which the other side is unable to shed myths. It's much easier for Israelis to shed myths because we've won, or at least it looks like we've won until this stage. We've certainly won. We're dominant, we're stronger, and so on. So we can afford you know, to allow people to write subversive history or more, more accurate history. But the, and the Palestinians are not there yet. There's also, incidentally, an Arab, uh, let, let me be quite frank, Arab Societies are violent and dictatorial, all of them, and uh, people pay dearly for writing things which people don't like. You get a knife in the back and you get your slow throat slashed, like the only Arab Nobel Prize winner in literature, in Najib Mahfouz. You know, you, get, you, get, you can actually get physically hurt. In democracies, they don't give you a job. There, they kill you. So it's it's more difficult to write honest history for an Arab. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so that um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It's very beneficial work for us. Um, my question is accidentally like a follow-up to your question. Um, Professor Chaim Geber says that um, you know what I'm going to ask you, right? Uh, that Palestinians have started self-defining um, themselves in the 16th century already, um, because um, he is relying on fatwas that were issued by a Qadi in Ramre. Um, in the 16th century. As far as you know, or um, let's say, how would you say, when exactly, in which point of history Palestinians started to call themselves Palestinians, to refer to themselves by this name? It's a problem. Look, there's, there's an Israeli, there was an Israeli sociologist called Kimmerling, and a colleague of his called Joel Migdal, who teaches in Washington or somewhere, who put together, wrote a book called The Palestinians, a, a portrait of a people, or a history of a people, something like that. That's the name of the book. Long book on Palestinian history, mostly sociological. And they argued in this book that Palestinian identity, 
Palestinianism can be dated back to 1834. I think I remember the date correctly. 1834. Why 1834? Because it was a small peasants' revolt in Jabal uh, Nablus, in the Nablus area, the Shechem area, in which peasants didn't want to pay their taxes to Ibrahim Pasha or uh, Muhammad Ali or whatever. Uh, they didn't want to pay taxes, and they rebelled. And uh, they didn't want to send their sons to fight in uh, well, the Pasha's armies and whatever, and they rebelled. Uh, and so they say, Kimberling and Migdal, that that was a Palestinian revolt in that specific small area today in the West Bank. Um, and, and that was the beginning of Palestinian nationalism. But nobody really called themselves, of course, Palestinians at the time. And you won't really find that usage of Palestinians calling themselves Palestinians until 1948. Because everybody in Palestine was a Palestinian. There were British officials, but there were large numbers of Jews. They all held Palestinian identity cards, as did the Arabs living in Palestine. So they couldn't really call themselves Palestinians because Jews, and Golda Meir famously said the same thing in a sort of a trick. You know, she said 18, in 1969 or something, she gave an interview in the Sunday Times. She said, there's Palestinian people. I'm a Palestinian. Here's my identity card from 1934 or something. There's no such thing as Palestinians. That's what she said. But that was uh, kind of stupid and political. In other words, she's saying in 69 there are no Palestinians, by which time there, was, there were Palestinians. They were calling themselves Palestinians, and they were identi identifying themselves as a Palestinian national movement. So what I'm saying is between 1834 and 1969, I would say that in the 1920s, that's when the Palestinian national movement, and most historians would agree with me on that, that that's when the national movement begins on the basis of an emerging Palestinian identity, a separate Palestinian identity. Why separate? Well, you can actually place, place it, in, uh, locate it in terms of chronology, in terms of months. What happened was that the Sykes-Picot Agreement, a British-French agreement from 1916, had earmarked most of Palestine for international rule, which the British and French meant essentially their rule conjointly after World War I. If the Allies would win, this Sykes-Picot Agreement would determine who ruled where. But what happened, in fact, was the British conquered, the British, not the French, conquered Palestine. Their army under Allenby conquered Palestine. And the British set up a military occupation. And then in 1920, they set up a civil government, which was called the British Mandate Government. From the, and, then, and at the same time, the French uh, decided to get, do away with a Arab regime which had ruled in Damascus from 1918 until July 1920 under Faisal, the Hashemite prince, the brother of Abdullah, who became the king of Jordan. And the prince of Jordan became, or Transjordan became the king of Jordan eventually. When the French threw Faisal out of Damascus, they conquered Damascus from Lebanon, they moved to Damascus, conquered it, and threw out Faisal in July 1920. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> when, when the French conquered uh, Damascus from, uh, from, from uh, in, uh, Faisal in 1920, threw him out, Faisal then was moved and became king of Iraq under the British. The Arabs of Palestine understood from July 1920 that they were no longer southern Syrians. Before that, before World War I, they thought of themselves not as Palestinians, but as Syrians of some sort, southern Syrians, because traditionally Palestine had been part of the Ottoman province of Damascus or Syria, traditionally. Over the years later, it was moved to Beirut, controlled by Beirut in the 1880s, but this is irrelevant. They thought of themselves as southern Syrians. When the French took over Syria, in the Palestinian leadership, the notables among the Palestinians understood we can no longer look to Damascus as our capital and future uh, state. And we can no longer be, because our future is under the British and their future is under the French. It's separate. We've become, we've been separated because of what happened to be the Allies. So from that point on, they began to think in terms of getting independence for Palestine by Palestinians from the British. Well, in Damascus, Syrian notables wanted a, a, a release and independence from the French who were ruling in Damascus. So July 1920 is the crucial date. When the French take Damascus, it ends Palestinian hopes that from Damascus they would be um, relieved of imperial dominance. Uh, that no longer exists for them. The British are ruling and that's it. Um, and, and so you can date Palestinian, the emergence of Palestinian national identity 
among some notables from that moment in July. And it's to do with the politics, not so much with evolving intellectual consciousness, but to do with the politics in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Benny. It's always great hearing from you every year and every opportunity. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Oh, I started this question with you, and I'm glad we waited until we had everybody here. Um, I, I noticed in your talk earlier that there was a, a fair amount of um, kind of binary explanation of the kind of, obviously, the, the Arab and, and the Israeli situation. Um, but the conversation around literacy and, uh, and almost as if an oral tradition. It's something I'd like to have you expound on more because I know that can be very value laden and at the same time it can be useful if we think in terms of how nations, individuals pass along information. Uh, passing along in a written way and, and, and do you perceive it also as having been passed along equally or as significantly or differently uh, in, in an oral uh, way. This is particularly to me having, you know, come from African oral traditions, which have not always been able to get librarians to come through, not always written. Look, in, in illiterate societies, in oral tradition is very important, and things passed down by word of mouth from father to son and so on. In, in Palestinian society, in which there's a notability which is literate, uh, there is some material which comes from the notability, and the notability is what, you know, the notables, the families of notables lead the national movements and the, 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 the intelligentsia of, of their people. Um, today, you'll find that, uh, that Palestinian historians and chroniclers say that, well, we don't have archives because we didn't produce archives because our people were illiterate or they didn't keep archives or had no idea that you're supposed to make archives and so on. And so we will rely, that's what Palestinian historians today say, like the one I mentioned recently, a man called Abdel Mana, we will rely in large measure on a, what has been passed down the generations as history by, uh, and by interviews, by interviewing people, grandparents, children, and whatever. Um, um, and they believe in the, the use and the, the, the value of what's called oral history. Um, I, I'm old-fashioned and I was brought up to believe that proper historical writing must be on the basis of documentation. That is, the historian reconstructs the past on the basis of documentation. And that oral, um, what's passed down in interviewing or oral history has some value but very limited value. People don't remember things properly and especially in an ongoing conflict, they will misremember what happened, uh, they will be in, in, introduced into what they remember, things which are told them by other people, uh, by political intent. Uh, in other words, they'll, they'll forget certain things and they'll supposedly remember them as a result of what somebody else told them, and they will remember things as a result of what people inject into them, which is politically motivated. So, so memories are not really reliable. That's, that's my sense. I, I tried a little bit when I wrote my first book on 48 on the Palestinian refugee problem. I tried to interview some people, and even among very literate and historically conscious people, I found that they don't really remember what you want them to remember, or what you want them to remember about. So, 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 um, I'll give you an example. Um, um, there was a man called Igael Yadin. He was number two man in the Haganah, in the Jewish Self-Defense Force in 1948, then the number two man, chief of operations in the Israeli army during the 48 war. Later became a famous archaeologist, uh, uncovered Masada, wrote books about it. He was a famous, if you like, historian archaeologist of the ancient world. In other words, a man with historical consciousness, understanding. He was very young in, uh, in, in 1948. I think he was about 30 years old, or 28, when he actually led the Israeli army. Because the chief of staff, the Haganah, leader of the IDF, was incapacitated by illness. So Yadin was the actual leader of the Haganah, the commander of the Israeli army in the 48 war. And I went to him, I remember, in 1980-something, 80 or five, I went to this dark flat in Rehavia in Jerusalem, very poorly lit, 
And that's what I remember. And, and um, um, I asked him about something specific. I wanted um, to know what he remembered as being chief of operations in the 48th war. What he remembered of the Israeli expulsion of Arabs from the towns of Lida and uh, Ramle on the 12th and 13th of July 1948. Did he remember anything? And he said to me, he said to me, I can't remember it. So I said, I've got the documents to prove it. I've got Itzhak Rabin's signature on the document saying expel the population of Lida on the 12th of July 1948, 1 o'clock. And uh, I've got other documents, you know, we've just expelled them, they're leaving, they're this, that. A whole, the documents are all there in the Israeli archives. And so I said to him, but, you know, so he said, you may be right. He, not, he wasn't disputing what he was saying. He said, I can't remember. Just, I don't remember. It's true. He was involved in lots of things. He was running a war on a number of different fronts at the same time and expelling 50,000 people from these two towns on the 12th of July wasn't exactly his priority. You know, he was thinking about war with the Egyptians and, and the war with the Jordanians and the Syrians and so on. Uh, but what that told me was that you can't really rely on memory, even of a very historically refined, intelligent guy with a very good memory. You can't rely on anything. Um, and that's one of the things he told me, that you've got to rely on documents. Now, then I thought that maybe, well, if you can't actually get facts from people, that is, they won't remember facts from 40 years ago, maybe at least you can get some color and get an atmosphere, that is, they'll be able to, to tell you how it felt 40 years ago, something specific. And so one day comes a photographer to my house, and he knows I'm dealing, I deal with 48, and he says to me, well, you know what, I've got one memory, a guy called Shlomo Arad, he used to be a photographer in Israel of uh, Newsweek. And he says to me, I've got one memory from 1948. He grew up in the Jezreel Valley, in the north of Israel, and he lived in a kibbutz. He was eight years old, I think he said he was. And he said, one day I remember all the young men in the kibbutz going out into the fields and shooting down the dogs and donkeys and cats and pigs and whatever was there, shooting down all the animals which were straying around in the fields there. Why were the animals there? Because the Arab population had vanished, had left all the animals behind, and there was a danger apparently of diseases, rabies, whatever, so they were told to shoot, to kill all the, the animals around. And this is something which I'd never encountered in the documentation and the IDF, that they had these mass killings of animals in the vicinity of the villages, you know. In, uh, so I thought maybe this guy, memory here, there's oral history which helps you build a picture of something. And then I thought, well, maybe I should go look at med the medical corps, IDF medical corps records from 1948. And I went and looked. And I found there the documentation for these mass cullings of animals which had left villages. In other words, they, they, they were the local units during one of the truces were told there was truces in the fighting. The fighting wasn't continuous through 48. There were large periods in which people weren't shooting each other. And, and the, the, the Israeli defenders or the Israeli soldiers in certain areas were told, OK, now you've got time to do something. Go kill the animals around here because they're a big danger. You found that in the medical records. What that showed me is that even color or even additional information which you won't necessarily expect in archives, if you look sufficiently in well-kept archives with lots of material, you will even find what you're looking for in that sense, which is like irrelevant to the main battles, but it's even, even that is there. And well, what I'm saying is historians have to rely on documents. Now, documents lie and they cheat and they self-serve. Also, people write things which are not true. People write things about things which they think they heard something from somewhere but isn't true. So they they uh, highlight their own contribution in a battle to, you know, as opposed to what somebody else did. These things are all true about documents, contemporary documents. But if you take all these things into account, the documents of a certain period are usually, if they're written by normal people, intelligent people who, uh, who are you know, relatively honest, they'll usually be much, much better than something somebody remembers or says he remembers 40 years on. And that's what I'm saying. And that's what you have to rely on, basically. Now, that's, that's the story. The problem with the Palestinians is they don't have the records. So the historians say, well, we don't have the records. Then we have to go to oral history. So we have to interview people. And, and then they say, well, no, you must believe in oral history. It's valuable. You must listen and accept what people tell you happened. Uh, for lack of documentation, they do that. But, but um, uh, I don't think that's, that's convincing. Um, though it's true that sometimes when people remember this guy, Adel Mana's new book on 48, he says that 
what people told him corresponds and correlates quite often to documents which are available from the Israeli side. So it's not what I'm saying is not whatever not everything that people say they remember about something which happened 40 years ago is a lie. It's not always untrue. Sometimes it's completely true, but you don't know if it's true. Whereas from the documents, especially if there's a number of documents, even from different sides, British, American, UN, Israeli, on something, if they correspond, then you can believe them much more than all of this. That's a wonderful explanation. Thank you. Uh, the last one is just a statement. I really also appreciate it very much. Um, they're very useful kind of, you know, reference to the Oxford, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, of Oxford University Press uh, definition of or Oxford University uh, Dictionary um, uh, refugee as being um, cannot be uh, displaced from one's own country. This had particular import in the United States, as you will probably recall, during the Katrina uh, event, right? When <coughs> many, especially um, disenfranchised African Americans, uh, furious with the president and with the press uh, over reports that he had these refugees on top of uh, the buildings. You know, of, asking for help and and and, um, and they, they, they are like we're not refugees now there are all, all sorts of interesting kind of cultural notions about you know the values related to a, who's a refugee what value does that person have as a human being versus who i am as a fully formed american but at the same time it is interesting relevant within the, the social context uh, to declare one's belonging and one's status as being unchanged. So I, I think that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation and discussion. Oh, sorry, can I you would speak like, up? yes, yes. I would uh, like, especially, uh, I would yeah. have two questions. I don't know if it's a low, but I start with the first one. You described the, the war in 1948 uh, from the point of view of the Arabs uh, as a religious war. I said in part. As an element in the I would like uh, to ask you if, from the point of view of Israel, there, we, there is a, a similar part of the uh, attention to the war from a religious point of view, or we have a secularized uh, perspective uh, or where identity, uh, society, politics are more relevant and religion is less. But I think I, I talked about that. I said from the Israeli perspective, because Israelis in 48 were essentially a, it was a secular society, a very secular society, and led by socialists, and religion played no, no real part in their thinking. They were thinking in terms also of history, but not religious history, but political history, and in terms of the political present. The, the war was seen by them as a political territorial war. That's what I said. Okay. And the religious played very little. They had no no hold on power at all, and they were very small in numbers in any case. And the second question is about uh, Rania from Jordan. About? Rania, the Queen Rania from Jordan. Well, this is gossip, we're talking gossip now. Good? No, gossip, no, 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 not at all. Uh, the question is, because you described the relationship between uh, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan for the past, I wanted to ask you if this personality, is, if this person is uh, having a rule or whatever, now in this relationship? No, I don't think she has a role. Uh, as far as I remember, she's a Palestinian. She's a Palestinian, the wife of Abdullah, the king, uh, Abdullah II. Mm -hmm. um, look, most Jordanians today are of Palestinian origin. Jordan is made up of two-thirds Palestinian people who came from Palestine in 48 and their descendants, or people who came from Palestine in 67 and their descendants, or people who came before 48 from Palestine and their descendants. Most Jordanians are of Palestinian origin. Um, and Rania, in that sense, that's one of the reasons he married her, is because she's Palestinian, and most of his population is Palestinian. So it, it sort of makes sense from his point of view. But I don't think she has very much power or effect on anything. She uh, does uh, humanitarian care or humanitarian work, as far as I remember. Thank you. Very clear is your talk. Thank you very much. Um, what's the situation? What's the mainstream in Israel? Do they believe in the existence of a real Palestinian, or what's the majority think now? Uh, or is just being considered as a buffer zone between the Arab world and Israel? 
I don't know. Look, I I think most Israelis that is still there is still a majority of, of Israelis that, uh, who believe that there is a Palestinian people and that there should be two states, a Jewish state side by side with a Palestinian state. Uh, in other words, they recognize the Palestinian claim and demand for statehood in part of the territory of mandatory Palestine. Uh, that's as far as I know. Um, I th I, unfortunately, most Israelis also think that this is not realistic, that it's not going to happen, that there's not going to be a two-state solution. And as I pointed out, I think the reason for that, they think, is that the Palestinians don't really want that. They believe that in the long durée, you know, in the long term, the Arabs are 500 million and the Jews are 6.5 million in the Middle East, and they will win out. So why give up and concede and compromise now when history inevitably will work in their favor? And there won't be a Jewish state in them, like there is no crusader state. Thank you for um, sharing that. Um, you mentioned three most important war aims on the Jewish side, 1948, and I caught two, I didn't catch the third. The first was the switch in the mindset of taking on territory. The second that I got was the ex expelling of Arabs from the area. What was the third war aim? That was the most important one, survival. The Jews wanted to survive the war. That's what their aim was, to survive the Palestinian Arab onslaught and then subsequently the Pan-Arab armies onslaught. Those were the war aims in both halves, the main war aim in both halves of the war. Well, I hope I'm not disappointing you, but historians have very little impact actually on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, post-Zionist, not post-Zionist, they won't really affect very much. And that's in general. Um, but there are, look, Israel is a democracy. There are historians in Israel, Israeli Jews, who uh, don't like Zionism. Uh, there are, um, some of them are what are called, called post-Zionists, who don't support the whole idea of Zionism, who think it was a mistake from the beginning, a mistake morally, a mistake uh, historically, uh, that it won't work, or uh, the Israelis did nasty things uh, in their history. And then, um, and some of them condemn Israel's existence. Uh, people like Elon Pape think there should be a one, one state. You know, Jews and Arabs should live together in peace uh, within one government, in one polity. And uh, uh, most Israelis think that's not going to happen and that's not realistic. But uh, that, that's, there are, you know, it's a, it's a democracy, it's different views. Uh, um, I think post Zionists have been gaining ground in Israel's universities over the years. Um, in faculties like, you know, in, in social sciences and even history and Middle East studies, you find in places like Tel Aviv and Be'er Sheva that um, anti-Zionists or so-called post-Zionists are becoming stronger over the, have become stronger over the past um, couple of decades. So <clears throat> I want to echo what everybody else is thanking for an excellent lecture and for walking some very, very fine lines. So I'm going to put you on one minute. You, you spoke of the of the forty eight war from the from the Arab side as a jihadist religious war. As part of as part, part of the religious religion by religion. And you were careful and you were careful to say that you had no documentation <clears throat> of an official line of throwing the Jews into the city. I didn't say no, but almost no almost expressions. Good. Good. And so this may not be a fair question, and you can just dismiss it as a do you do you see the forty eight war as a genocidal war? Well, it would have been a genocidal war had the Arabs won and killed all the Jews, or most of the Jews in Palestine. But since they didn't win, 
and it didn't turn out genocidal, uh, then you have to ask what, what was motivating them. Did they intend genocide? And on that, you need Arab documentation. You need Arab cabinet ministers sitting around the table in Cairo or in uh, Damascus and talking to each other and saying, let's kill all those Jews. And you don't have that documentation. And if they don't announce these things publicly and you don't have it in, pre in interviews or exchanges with ambassadors, they don't say that then you can't base it on it. You can guess. And the Jews at the time felt that. Because it was three years after the Holocaust, they felt these guys want to kill us all. But that's feeling. That's not historical proof. So that, that's where it stands. It is isn't uh, So to follow, yeah. to follow up on these questions, I have a quick question. So if the War of 48 was partially uh, jihad, I have two questions. One, um, Jeffrey Hurth and Matthias Kunzel and Rita Becker, the people are doing work on the, on the radio, on the Nazi radio, on the, the impact of Nazi propaganda, and King Hussein's travels to the region uh, trying to inspire a jihad. Khajamin al Hussein. Yeah, so I would argue. So, um, so what can you explore? Can you unpack some of the, the, uh, the influence of the sort of jihadist tendency of Hussein in the, at, at that moment? in the conflict with the Zionists, the Jews. And then the second, comment, the second question is, um, yesterday I spoke about globalization and anti-Semitism and the role of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and political Islam and Jihad when it comes to contemporary anti-Semitism. Can you speak of how, um, what, if Jihad was a part of the struggle in 1948, is it a greater struggle today? Is it increased? Is it ebbed, flowed? Look, I, I think there have been ups and downs in the religious input into the Israeli-Arab conflict. In other words, on the Arab side, there's a, there are times when religion plays a very important role, like in the Arab riots of 1929, when the Arabs were shouting, you know, the Jews want to destroy the mosques on Temple Mount and build their own uh, and then they uh, build their own temple there, and uh, Husseini uses that to rouse the Arabs uh, to um, um, demonstrate and then subsequently to slaughter Jews. Um, at that time, uh, the, the religious element was very important in the Arab side, on the Arab side, in the conflict. Um, uh, in Israel versus the Gaza Strip, Hamas controlled Gaza Strip. Uh, and, and today, I would say, in general, against the backdrop of the rise of jihadism and Islamism in the Arab world, in general, I would say the role of Islam is very important in the conflict today. We're in one of those stages, one of those ups in that uh, graph. Um, I think in 48 was also there. Um, um, but but it, it goes up and down. How much religion is input into the uh, conflict and how much is other, uh, other elements. Uh, Husseini wasn't really that important in 48, that's the truth. He was sitting in Cairo. He was the nominal head of the Arab National, the higher committee, the Arab higher committee, and of the Palestinian national movement going to war against the Jews in Palestine. But actual control on the ground, and this is something we find in Israeli intelligence reports about who's controlling what, who's who's initiating the violence, who's following whose lead in the... They, they say Husseini didn't have very much control. So, so even if he wanted to inject jihadism, and it's interesting that he never declared jihad. He himself, unlike the um, ulama of Al-Azhar University, he didn't come out with a public statement of jihad in a 48. Um, so... You didn't go to Iraq when it was in Germany? Well, that would have been long before the 48 yeah, war. That's 41. Yeah, 41. 4041. Um, I don't remember if he declared that if it would have been jihad, he would have declared it against the British, not against the Zionists in Iraq. Um, um, but he certainly didn't declare it in 47 and 48, as far as I know. Maybe somebody will find evidence he did in some way say or declare or issue a fatwa, but I haven't seen any, any evidence of that. He didn't actually have that much influence, but he, he, he had an atmospheric influence. That is, he broadcast to his people, uh, shoot Jews, kill Jews now. Uh, and that, that's what these people did in, on the ground in Palestine while he and his people, the leaders of the Arab Na higher committee, were sitting in Cairo or in uh, Beirut. Um, but as I say, it's worth thinking of the conflict and the 
input of jihadism in the conflict in terms of sort of an up and down graph, depending on circumstances in the region, uh, like in 40, 41, 44, he's issuing these uh, broadcasts from, from Berlin and from Italy uh, calling for jihad and whatever against the British. Um, there it's, it's important. How in, uh, one of the problems with uh, Jeffrey Herf's book about his activities in Berlin, uh, especially in these broadcasts, is what effect what effect did they actually have? In other words, did these broadcasts have an actual effect on anybody in the Middle East? Were they listening to the radio, and did they act on what he was calling for? It's not that clear. So um, that, that's that's yeah, that's what I would say. Anybody else with a comment or question? Is it? Yeah. If, if you say that uh, there was no intent to kill all the Jews, how do you? Where, how do you I didn't say that. I said there's no proof of it. Okay. Well, uh, Husseini, Husseini went to Berlin. Yes. He met Adolf Hitler. Yeah. And they became friends. And what what did what did what Adolf did Hitler didn't think of Arabs as friends? He yeah. thought of them as lower humanity. Okay. Yeah, let's say. But, but we know <laughs> what Hitler's intention was. <laughs> yes. Okay. And they really like each other. So it's pretty clear that he was trying to be a, a, to, to make a de genocide in Palestine, no? Yeah, I think, I think the Germans, I think they found, the evidence has come to light in recent years that Hitler did plan to kill, or his people planned to kill the Jews in Palestine, and that Husseini was supposed to be an instrument in this plan, maybe to become the ruler in Palestine or even of a wider area in the Middle East. And probably Husseini lent his hand to this. He said, yes, when you conquer the Middle East, I will gladly be your proconsul in Palestine or elsewhere, and we'll take care of these Jews. Because he wanted to take care of the Jews for his own reasons, but also because he was an anti-Semite. Uh, but that's as far as I would go. You know, that's as far as the evidence goes. But, um, yeah. Yeah, so just one question. question. Yeah, earlier, when you answered the question about what the majority of Israelis think about the Palestinian nation, um, it's based on, on uh, opinion polls. Sure, yeah. I understand. Um, my question is about this comment you put in the end of your answer. You said that um, the Israeli state is just a comma in a history of the Middle East. I mean, not, not that you said it, yes? But it's like the... Um, they take the long view. State. They take the long view. To the, the Arabs take a long view of the conflict and of Israel's presence. Yes, but which... Arabs. I mean, who says I think this? Arabs in general, if they're thinking Arabs, they think, look, we're 500 million, these guys are six and a half million here, they can't survive in the end. I understand this thinking, but I just, I'm just asking you, what, what you, you said you're basing everything on documentation. Are there any documents on this matter? I, I think there are. I think there are. You will find people writing that um, this is a passing phenomenon, uh, that we are strong allies on our side, and it just doesn't make sense that they can survive here forever. Uh, this is, I think this, this you will find evidence. This, I can't this I've seen in every newspaper, also Palestinian newspapers, of course, like a Fayette, etc. Yeah. But I'm, I'm asking if there, there is a, a clear documentation of an institutional... You mean like an Arab leader saying that? Yes. I haven't seen that. Well, no. But as you say, really in the press or on broadcasts or interviews with imams or muftis or whatever, okay. you, will, you will hear that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, yeah. I don't have documentation. I would actually like, there's an interesting thing about that, which has always exercised my thinking. And that's to do with the thinking and the inner councils of the PLO. We know the Hamas says we want to destroy Israel. They publicly announced it, the manifesto, you know, the 1988 um, tract says that. But among the Palestinians in the PLO, uh, sitting in Ramallah, or originally sitting in Tunis, then moving to Ramallah, we don't know what exactly they say among themselves. Did Arafat say mm -hmm. to his people, well, we'll, get, we'll sign this agreement and come to Palestine, consolidate our hold in the West Bank and Gaza, and from there we'll go on and kill all the Jews or destroy the state of Israel? Did he say that to his people, this is our strategy, but we have to keep it hidden because we can't tell the West because that's what we're after, because they won't like it, etc., etc.? Do they say these things in the inner councils? And if they do, how come this hasn't been published by Israel? Eh, because we, after all, do have good spy organizations who have, you know, bugs in the chair of Arafat, or they found, the, you know, listening devices in his chair in Tunis, or things of that sort. How come we don't publish such information if it exists? Because it would help our cause, politically, propaganda. 
And I have no answer to that. Uh, either we don't have these statements by these leaders when they're in council, or they don't actually say these things. And therefore, the question is whether they really mean that or not, if they don't actually say it even in their closed circles. Or maybe they don't say it because they know there's listening devices. In, you know, so, so they can't allow themselves even in private to say things which are really on their minds. These are questions I don't have answers to. Thank you. Yeah. I, I thought I, I, uh, I heard or I read in the newspaper um, once of Arafat actually comparing the Zionists to the Crusader state. He's done that many times. Yeah, all right. So that, that's where it comes from. Well, that's... Uh, com look, you can take that in two ways. Comparing the Zionists to the Crusaders means that they are strangers and shouldn't be here and have carved out a state which is illegitimate. European yeah. state in the middle of the Middle East, and it's our territory. It can also mean their fate will be the same as the Crusaders. That was the we, assumption of the... Of the well, it, but there could be yeah. both things. Yeah. Um, no, he, he, he said this in a number of times, uh, on a number of occasions, that uh, uh, these are the new Crusaders. This is normal discourse in the Arab world and among Palestinian leaders, that these are Crusaders. But they don't necessarily follow it up, not explicitly, that we will, they will be destroyed the same as the Crusaders were. Though I think the Hamas does say that. In its charter, it does say from 1988, these are Crusaders and will vanish just like the Crusaders. But Arafat, I don't know if he used that second part. Yeah. Uh, I think that the Secretary General of the Arab League, Azam Pasha, said something like that okay. in the interview. Okay, uh, yeah. let, let's go into that. In 19, well, Subsequently, Israel propaganda said that in 1948, just before the pan-Arab invasion of May 48, Azam Pasha, um, um, who was the Secretary General of the Arab League, and in some sense speaking for, a spokesman for all the Arab states just before the invasion, um, said that they are like the Crusaders and they will be driven into the sea or massacred like the Mongolians massacred oh, us so. in Baghdad in 12, whatever it was. Um, that, that, that's what he said, uh, supposedly, according to Israeli propaganda after 48. But that's been looked into, and he never actually said that. I myself checked it, because always people cited his interview with the New York Times and saying it on the 15th or 16th of May, and it's not true. There is no such interview. Um, he didn't say that. What he did say was something similar to that in answer to a question in 47. Before the UN resolution, he actually said something which sounds a bit like that. He certainly compared Israel to the Crusaders, not Israel, but the uh, Zionist movement, to the Crusaders. But he, but, but he didn't actually say we will kill them all or slaughter them all uh, like the Mongolians did to us Arabs in Baghdad in the 13th century. He didn't actually say it quite like that. But it's a quote which is often trotted out and is, is incorrect. It's not dated from the right time and the quote isn't, isn't exactly accurate. But you will find it even in one of my books. It appears in one Which of my one? books originally. I think it's in Righteous Victims, because I, I, that was what I thought was true. But later I checked this and I found that the quote is not a proper quote. Okay. It wasn't me who discovered that. There was a, um, a, a South Africa, South, a, an Australian a, a computer scientist. I don't know how he, why he got onto the subject, but he checked this thing. And then wrote, a, I think his name was Bell. And he, he wrote an article about the origins of this quote. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Comment? Okay, so, so on behalf of everybody here, Benny, thank you very much.